Hello, <laughs> dear academics, ex-academics, all talks, uh, and the listeners of Mind Your Own Revisions podcast. Today, I have a very, very, very special guest, Ooh. Els de Bute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. Welcome, Els, to this. Well, uh, thank you, it's good. <laughs> to this episode. Thank you so much for agreeing to, uh, yeah, to join me here on this podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm so excited because Els is one of my coaches. Yeah. Uh, she was my career coach. Well, she is still, and um, especially at the time when I was thinking about transitioning out of academia she helped me a lot and uh, then we always kept in touch yes. and that's why I wanted to bring her in and uh, another tiny thing maybe not so tiny for me um, <laughs> okay. is that she's kind of the godmother of the mind your own revisions podcast it's the <laughs> was the first person actually you were the first person I bounced this idea back and forth with, otherwise it was only in my head so yeah, it became yeah. a reality after we talked about it yeah so super there is a severe danger with me in in running things like that by past me because I may even say do it go yeah. for it yeah <laughs> it's very so dangerous there's a, a very there's a real danger behind it <laughs> yeah exactly so very shortly i would like to introduce else well it's it will take a long time if i go through everything but very shortly she's the co-founder of make me fly and at make me fly they um offer solution-focused coaching, and lots of trainings around uh, career management, leadership, collaboration, and life, not only for academics, but since they are based in Leuven, and there is a, a lot of academics here in this small city that we live in, they uh, run into academics who have career issues a lot as well. True. <laughs> yeah, and Elsa has several books, and the latest one is called Content, uh, which she co-authored with uh, her colleague, other co-founder of Make Me Fly, Rila Lisens. And uh, most of her books are published in Dutch. Let's yeah. hope that they come into the world in English uh, in the coming years, no? Maybe one day. Yeah. And finally, she's also a podcaster. Else. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and the podcast is called Simply Make Me fly yep so thanks again else for uh coming into uh mind your own revisions today and we will talk uh, a lot about academics mental health yep. and also burnout because yep. that's what i loved about uh getting coaching from you actually it was still a time that i was feeling a bit like uh yeah this uh, burnout <laughs> shame guilt all of yep. these things around it and then i was in the coaching like session and you said oh yeah i had like two of those already and now <laughs> maybe you have like three how many i i lost count <laughs> <laughs> could you tell us a bit about that your own journey yeah. your own yeah experience with this thing called burnout yeah yeah well um when i say i had two or three or i don't know how many um actually i don't know whether they were like full-fledged burnouts um, one of them was um it's not something that i am proud of nor i'm ashamed for because some people wear it like you know batch of pride but that's that's not what it represents um, however, I do feel that I have to be open about it, open enough about it to make sure that there's no taboo around it, that people don't think, well, the coach is the perfect uh, human being, the superhuman, and that is not true. Um, so maybe a little bit about my journey. I studied psychology um, and uh, I was extremely young when I graduated. I was 21 when I graduated from the university. And then I had my first job at um, the Belgian railways. Um, and even though they take us from one place to the other, um, it was a very, very bad experience for me. It was actually the thing that made me crash the first time um, because I came out of um, university with a very good grade and I was really hungry for knowledge and doing things that are useful 
And actually, I think it was more bore out that I suffered there because I there were days that I didn't have anything to do. And there were days that I had one hour of work, but nobody was really waiting for it. And that's where I discovered that if the match between a person and the context is wrong, it is um, traumatic. So I left there after my first crash feeling what like you just described, feeling like a failure, like I should have been the one who had the highest grade in my year. So I should have been the one who had a, you know, like a flying career, which I didn't have so far. And I uh, pursued my other dream, which was music. So I went into, I did an entrance exam at uh, what is now the Lucas School of Arts. And for four years, I condensed it into four years instead of five. I, um, I was playing the guitar actually and singing Bach choral uh, sessions, which I completely enjoyed. It was such a great time. I was also convinced I was going to be a, a guitar teacher which I was during my studies, but I decided that there the context would be right, but the content would be wrong. <laughs> I love playing guitar, but I would be very fast. I would be against some sort of a ceiling and doing the same things all over again with some variations. And it wasn't enough for me. So I was in a better context, but the content wasn't right. So then I started in... Uh, consulting, which was a really, really good experience in a way that you get trained, you get an immensely much training, you get access to levels in organizations that you would normally not get access to when you're that young. And um, there I bumped into a conflict with one of my bosses. And so that was my first real crash. Actually, when I got my first child, he's now 21, but I got my first child and I struggled really with my own perfectionism. And I was used to, you know, working, working whenever I, I had to or felt like, or I was not that structured. And so there came this little human being that demands one thing really, really, really needs it, the structure. Um, and also some limitations to my time. So that was the first time when I discovered that my perfectionism, so actually not the context nor the content, but the person was being um, mismatched with, you know, what was happening in my context, because I tried to still do all of these things that I did before, and you only have 24 hours in a day, one head, two hands, two feet, and that even gets me with the lucky ones. So then I had to rethink it and I went to industry and then a little bit fast forward, I went to another company when I had my second child. Um, and there I learned a lot, but I had once again, a mismatch between me and the context. And so I had to discover that me and context, there should be a total fit, either it fits or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, we all make concessions in some ways. Um, also, I do that in my own company, but I, discovered that I am not made to work for a boss and I do not I, I love advising and coaching people in these large organizational structures as long as I am not part of it aha uh -huh. So that's Including when I had universities, to... I guess. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I actually, I applied for a number of universities before I started my own business, but they didn't want me. And actually, I think they were right because the, I did not fit with the culture or the, the structure in the organization. So when I crashed there, I decided this is going to be my last one. And then I started my own business. And the first five years I worked alone because, and I adored it. I um, well, worked alone. I had clients, obviously, and I had several collaborations, um, but I didn't have meetings that kept on going endless and endless. So, because then I had to pay me by the hour. <laughs> uh, it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't all gold. Um, because I had a very difficult time after two, three years when it was a real make or break moment. I had to decide either I continue and then I have to do it completely differently or I uh, find a job again. Mm -hmm. I always told myself if I wouldn't make it self-employed that I could always find a job again. And so that was once again a career choice moment for me. 
um, uh, where I I looked at a number of vacancies, and once I reached to the, the phrase you will report to, I said, I don't do that very well. <laughs> I don't report. <laughs> yeah. And I remember distinctively thinking this would be burnout number four. I mean, I looked at a vacancy and so I said, no, <laughs> but that meant that I had to go full force in my own, uh, in my own uh, company. And we are now two partners and two um, people who are half time on our payroll, um, which was also a whole new level um, and about 20 something um, wonderful freelance people who collaborate with us for career coaching. Um, and we try to keep the structure as light as possible. And also we do not have these endless meetings we, because we all hate it. <laughs> I think actually most people hate it, except people who are really lonely. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. Let me yeah. think about that. Probably. Or people who want an audience, and then I would say, why don't you learn to play the guitar or something or sing yeah. and get your <laughs> audience, but don't keep other people hostage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so even as self-employed, I still have to watch my own boundaries because there's a funny thing. Actually, I, yesterday I spoke to a colleague of mine and she said, I, if I continue like this, I'm going to crash. And she's been working years in a row to get enough clients. And now that she has enough clients, she has no, no, no space to breathe. So it will always be, you know, finding the right balance between peaks and lows and, and making sure that you do the things that work for you. Uh, both in what am I doing content-wise? Am I in the right context? What about the relationships, the contacts that I have? What about the purpose of the thing that I do? Um, because that can also be a reason why people get into burnout. Um, so that will always be it. I always call it work in progress. Um, because every year and every, every year that we make this new thing, like the vision board that's behind me, that was the one that we made with the... We, we make actually we make four of them and we put them together like a puzzle but this was mine um and so every year i try to rethink what gives me pleasure and joy and what is draining my energy and then i try to do something about it because it would be no point in having your own organization and then still suffering the same things as when you were in someone else's organization yeah, and the academics, actually, I came across them for the very first time when I went to HR in my the first job after consulting, um, because I remember I didn't know anything about the academic world. Um, and it fascinated me that much that I started working more in it and in the job that I had afterwards. Um, all, everyone had a PhD. If you did not have a PhD, it was like, yeah, but it's just a, he just has a master in science. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas an industry that was considered to be the closest thing to God. So, <laughs> and uh, so that's where then I got in, in, in touch with the academic, uh, the academic world and with the, it is a very, peculiar world and it, uh -huh. it reminded me a little bit of the, the school of arts uh -huh. because you know um you seem to be surrounded by people who are at least as talented as you <laughs> and that gives a whole bunch of struggles wow. so that's where my and obviously being in Leuven helps but that's where my working with academics um found roots uh -huh. yeah so um, can you can you say more about those struggles like do, do you think there are some um some things so specific to the academic world or to academics as people or people with phd like how would you define yeah well um career wise one of the biggest questions that, that i see a lot is um not knowing where to go from here and that can be either after um, finishing the PhD or it's getting to an end, 
or um, having done a few years as a postdoc and you know every year or two years you have to renew your contract because that is something very particular for the academic world in the rest of the world normally you can have a temporary contract for maximum two years and after that you're in for life unless if someone wants to stop it you or the other party yeah in in belgium i guess that is more, more yeah or less. yeah there are some exceptions but a permanent contract is more the rule than the exception and in the academic world it is not which makes you rethink every time again where do i go from here and can i even stay here is there a budget and if it's not this what would it be and then i noticed that um you have this um uh there's a communication gap between the non-academic world and the academic world. Mm -hmm. In the academic world, you don't have to explain what a PhD entails. You don't have to explain that it means becoming really self-reliant, working very autonomously, um, that you have to collaborate with, with a number of people, but in the end, you're the one who's responsible, that it is an extremely long project, that you will probably be guiding other people as well. So you don't have to explain it to an academic. They know because they were there. And I remember when I was at that first job in, uh, in the chemical sector, um, I received a resume with someone who was put, put after his name, put PhD. And I thought I don't really know what that is so I went to my boss who was the country manager for the company the HR manager and I said can you explain to me what does this what does this mean is this like studying or is it working and he said well I don't really know but I reckon they stayed at university for four years longer and so oh my yes, god <laughs> yes that's what was this <laughs> well, uh, this was 2002, okay. so a long time ago, but still I noticed that for academics it's obvious, but when you go outside the academic world, you have to be able to translate the experience that you have towards the non-academic non world and monetizing in whichever way money or a specific job or responsibility that you want to have making sure that this four years of very intense experience that you had that you really sell it as experience and that you are aware of many academics are not aware of it of being aware of what did i learn and in transferable skills what did i learn by having this experience not just on the technical field not just the content, but also in working with other people, um, making compromises. Um, I've seen many, many PhD students who struggled because they had two promoters or one promoter and a co-promoter and one said go left and the other one said go right. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very common, it's a very common struggle, I think. And so that means that from a very young age, you have to find somewhere, you know, negotiate so that everyone can say yes to the end result, because that is basically where your your life depends on as a PhD. Yeah. So that is one, one of the biggest struggles in career management. And so the other one that is linked to it is um, not knowing what you're worth. And even doubting if you're worth anything, if there's anything you can do, can offer to the world that has any value. And it is because I noticed there's, there, are, there are quite some differences in the academic world, but I noticed that it is what we call a feedback poor environment. Mm -hmm. There's not that many times that people have received positive feedback, like the way that you handled this problem it's absolutely amazing i'm amazed you will hardly get that kind of feedback um there are some exceptions with promoters and bosses and lab managers who do give positive feedback but that means that you only get pointed to the things that you didn't do right and that then is somehow in our heads, we don't learn that way as a human being. You learn to get you know, over it and also see the good stuff, 
but that's a really tough experience. If we would only learn from the things that we, we did wrong, then we would have depression by the age of one. So, and that is, that is where I see that all these extremely intelligent people who do extremely difficult things then somehow start to doubt themselves in a way that I think, huh? So <laughs> one of the things that I have, that I usually do in a first coaching session is start digging for or dusting off all the qualities that I see in throughout that but by just talking about the things that people have done so far, but all the qualities that I see, all the gold that's there that they apparently do not see anymore. And um, so those are those are the two the two main issues. There's a whole list of other issues. Um, I also see academics who want to stop their research and not obtain their PhD because they doubt if they're cut out of the right wood. Hmm. Um, I also, every now and then, I have the accidental academic. Um, so because there was a position available and they were asked for it and they had no other plans at that time, they said, yeah, why not? Let's go for it. And so that's what I call the, the accidental academic. Um, and some of them then rediscover that even though it wasn't a very conscious choice at the time, that they still like what they do um, and that they find enough purpose and that actually it was an accident, but it's a happy accident. Mm. And in some cases, it's not a happy accident and it's just a matter of harvesting. Okay, what did I learn so far and where do I want to go from here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are more like career, uh, career questions, shifts, shifting career yep. questions they, they come yep. to you with. But do you, do you see them um, like sharing a common mindset or something, the academics that come to you? Like, is it, for example, you mentioned perfectionism for yourself. Yeah. Do, do you see that more in academics or... Is it uh, yes. like a, something we are making up? Oh, academics, we are per perfectionists or so. Yeah. Is there like, a, yeah, so, some things that are specific to academics? Yeah. The demands in academia are really, really high. And everyone finds that really obvious. Of course, the demands are high. If I compare it to the world outside, there's also rules that have very high demands but not all of them have the same level of demands. And also it's an environment where you're, you learn to think critically because that's the foundation of research. And I think you had actually a very good podcast about that. The very uh, first one. The very <laughs> first one. And I learned it from, from that podcast. I said, well, ah, that's where it comes from. So because you're constantly criticizing and questioning everything you forget to look at what's already earned or developed so you forget to look at the progress that you're making mm. and what always strikes me is i have this exercise that i do in in all career coachings it's called the top moments uh, where I ask people to think about the three highlights of their career so far. And I also do that with PhD students who were like one and a half or two years in their PhD, so halfway. And I ask them to think about three moments that they cherish or that they were proud of or that they were having fun in what they were doing. And I'm always astonished if people say, I don't have that. Because to me, you, if you look hard enough, you can find it on a daily basis. I cannot imagine having one and a half years of very hard work and struggles and not having one highlight. Even, you know, making it smaller and thinking of small successes. And that is something that I see more in academics than outside academia is that uh, they... The, the lack of sense of success mm. and not like success like now I am Wolf of Wall Street like success <laughs> big boat and stuff like that but the feeling of having accomplished something of being successful doing something and something came out of it and even if it was difficult to say okay so 
what was the success behind this? What can I, what did I learn? Mm. And that is something that I see in, in academia much more. And also two other things. One I also see in, in, in management and, and executive positions sometimes um, because we're getting a bit of a different vibe there. One of them is feeling guilty of taking time off. Mm. Yeah, so I have feeling guilty about even sleeping. <laughs> Sleeping, eating, you know, the basic stuff. <laughs> we are not above <laughs> <Human> that. <stuff. laughs> yeah. Um, so that is one, one thing that I definitely see there. It is that, 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 the denial of being human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this guilt of taking time off. Um, so that is one, one of the, the specifics that I also see with academics a lot. And, you know, to... If you put all of that together, you have this dangerous cocktail of feeling like a failure constantly. Oh, that's the other one. Um, something that doesn't succeed is seen as a failure. Automatic. And, yeah. <laughs> and it is even a personal failure. And that's, on the one hand, it's just a consequence of caring a lot about what you do. On the other hand, it cannot run out of hand either because then you feel like a failure and that is not completely correct. And that makes also people who, who are in academia who don't feel as happy as they should be feeling <laughs> or they don't feel as accomplished as they thought they should be by now or even their context is telling them this is where you should be by now it makes them walk around with this mix of guilt and shame and stress and and that's where academic burnout comes from um and I, then i always have to take people back to basics like okay so why are you even doing this what got you there what are your hopes and your dreams and how can you keep this up? Because you do need sleep and you do need food and you do need to move and you need relationships and maybe even want to have kids at some point. And would you sacrifice all of that because of this guilt, shame, accomplishment-driven cocktail? Mm. And that is, that is really something particular in, in, um, in the, or the, the company world. I see more and more people saying, I never lose. That's the Mandela quote. I never lose. I either win or I learn. It is true that you can lose some things, obviously. But um, it's more about what do we learn from this? And it is funny, actually, because in academia, when I look at PhDs, you're supposed to do something that is new because otherwise it wasn't worth the research. And still we expect it to turn out right the first time or after a number of tries. It cannot fail. That's not very logical. Exactly, exactly. I know people who stop their PhDs because in, in sciences, because their like lab experiments didn't yield results. And they're like, yeah, but I, I'm not getting the results, not the results I want, but not, it's yeah. like, it's just not working this thing. That's also a result, but, but not a good enough result yeah. for the academic world. So, yeah. I did notice that there is this counter movement a little bit. You have somewhere the Journal of Failed uh, Experiments or something like that. I think there's. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. I don't know. Or for it, for scientists. Rights for it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's a bit of a counter movement. I don't know if anyone anyone uh, dares to write something in it. And then there's also um, which is a mix between academia and and uh, outside academia world. There's also the the fuck up nights. Ah yes, I spoke in one. <laughs> you spoke in one. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I spoke in one some how uh, two years ago or so about an article of mine, a journal article of mine that turned into a, like, a, I don't know, a decade long 
think not a decade I'm exaggerating it's just there was this piece I couldn't get published it got rejected like nine times or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I yeah. kept pushing and I kept you pushing. kept pushing and lots yeah. of colleagues of mine said at that time to me I was going wow you're but if I if my thing is not published after three tries, three journals, I just we give stop. up on it. I'm like, no, no giving up another one. Just yeah. reformat it to that journal, another <laughs> one. And finally it's published. Wow. <laughs> Made it. <laughs> yeah, you see, <laughs> that's one of your major accomplishments. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking back, I don't really see it that way. Actually, when, when you were talking about these three high points, I remember my answers to that in the coaching sessions with you. And it didn't have to do the sense of accomplishment. It didn't have to do with my academic work. That's what yeah. I remember. One of them was finishing PhD because it was like, it was over. <laughs> yeah. Anything until that point, it's like, no, it doesn't count, doesn't count. I mean, didn't see anything just like you said and it is still lingering those that person is still in me somewhere yeah yeah yeah. and it's just a consequence of being drilled for aim higher aim higher aim higher yeah. and um it's like if it's not a nobel prize then it's not worth it yeah even even <laughs> when it is nobel prize oh who was in the jury huh it's only yeah. nobel <laughs> <laughs> yeah who was in the jury and was there counter research and was yeah. it do we still believe in that stuff did, did they do so. positive discrimination for me because i'm a woman what is <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah indeed and yeah. In, in that way you can you know like destroy everything exactly but also your self-worth yeah and when you when you said when you mentioned this thing about like success versus failure you know if something doesn't succeed it's automatically failure i also thought of the idea of deliverables in the academic world like like you said a, there are very long projects yes for which you do something every day but many of us are not able to look back on the day or the week or the month or sometimes the year and see something finished quote unquote finished yeah for some of us, it's an article that's published. Okay, then it's finished. It's something out there or a PhD that's finished or a book that's finished. But otherwise, if you're running in millions of experiments, it's just, oh, it's just daily work. Work, yeah, playing around. It is uh, very difficult to indeed wrap your mind around it as an academic. That happened to me like all those years. It's just I didn't yeah. see anything finished. Day and, in, day yeah. out, month in, month out, year in, year out. Nothing and fun. whereas a four-year project in, in industry it doesn't exist. It exists in real estate. When you're like redeveloping a whole site. Yeah. <laughs> then there's something like a four-year or a six-year project. But in other, in other cases, even in pharmaceuticals, four-year projects do no longer exist. Because they make these little spurts and they use the agile methodology. And um, I, I once delivered a course. It wasn't from, from Make Me Fly. I did that for another organization. But I delivered a course being managing my PhD. And part of it was uh, project management, really the basics for PhD students. And I remember there was a lot of resistance to it. Like, you cannot put a PhD in milestones. I said, well... I can mention two or three, like your defense, your pre-defense, your handing in your uh, the book. Um, so that we can already put there. And when is the money run out? Okay, another milestone. <laughs> and then we could start um, counting back like, oh, I have an, um, an, uh, a value uh, scholarship. So I have every year I have to do something and produce some results or a report. Okay, how long does it take for you to do that report? And so try to structure the time a little bit more and um you can do that with a phd and it the, the we all people often see the disadvantage like yes but if i put that in writing and it doesn't work i don't know how long this takes and then i will be pressuring myself in an 
um, in, in a way that doesn't work. And some promoters even said, no, don't put it into a planning because it's an organic process. <laughs> and this organic process and some works for some people, but for most people, it feels like being in the dark for three and a half years and then being, being in the panic zone for the last six months. So um, it also can give you some peace of mind, but also to be able to look back and say, okay, did I plan right? What did I accomplish? And what's next? And to give you the fuel for motivation to do these little sprints that we do in Agile uh, to say, okay, so now I will be focusing on my experiments and, and I hope to be done then. So, and then come back. And this was often the time that I looked at their four year planning and, and had to make it on a flip chart like that. And then uh, I asked, and so where is the vacation going? And some of them put it in, especially um, students who came from countries far away um, and who had to plan like their vacation because it was a full month or six weeks because you don't go to India for a week or a weekend. <laughs> so they had to plan it long in advance. And other people said, vacation? I don't do vacation. Or they put it in and their promoter said, uh-uh. <laughs> we don't do vacation here. Um, and then I thought, okay, let's talk again in a few years because you can you can keep that up for like yeah. you can even keep it up for four years but after that you will be extremely tired yeah. which is illegal by the way the last thing you said was the supervisor saying oh we don't do vacations that's yeah yeah indeed and well actually i meet that in industry as well uh, bosses who say ah but you know you can have these paid out. You don't have to take them, but it's it even there. It's illegal, and you have the right to take vacation. If it works for you, do it. If it doesn't work for you, do something else. Exactly. And that is also something that in coaching, and no doubt in in burnout coaching that that you do as well. That you have to people make decide on what do I need to keep myself and my body up and, and my brain up and running. Because the brain follows the body, yeah? Yeah. The, but that's one of the most difficult things, like getting a person to identify what they need. And that was the case for me. That's why I needed so much coaching around this because I just didn't know. Yeah. It was all uh, uh, coming from the thoughts that were planted in there all my life from like outside thing. Oh yeah, you work this much. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. That's what people like you yeah. do. So what do you mean but by what I need? Yeah. <laughs> and there is a thing that is not different for academics than for anyone else. And they keep forgetting when I, um, I sometimes give a mini course uh, in time management as well. And I always start with a very simple 24 hour, seven day schedule. And the first thing that people have to um, strike out with a marker is the not negotiables like sleep. And, you know, I know people who get by with four hours of sleep and they are quite okay. And then I know people unicorns. Can, yeah, <laughs> no, actually I know a few. Uh -huh. And uh, because one of our friends was someone who only needed four hours of sleep. And so he went to sleep at two, he got up at six and he was okay. Um, which gave him a lot more time to be productive and to even have a hobby, etc. Now I cannot function on four hours of sleep. I know now I've, I've thought that for a very long time, which was actually also the basis for a number of burnouts or near burnouts. That is that I need my sleep. And so that means, and even when you get, let's say a little less young, uh, then it gets even more important. But I think I have been depriving my body and my brain for many, many, many decades. I remember studying for a course that I had to deliver in my consulting years. Um, I had to uh, drive to Ghent, be there at eight in the morning and studying until two in the morning because someone handed me over, this is the course for tomorrow. And then I would say, challenge accepted. And then I would be there and you know drink coffee all day long. And I did that because I 
that's the way I was raised. Why sleep if you can do something else? And that's where I think I put the first foundation of a number of um, poor times in my, in my life because yeah. I created these habits of depriving my body of everything it needed. Uh -huh. Sleep, eating, um, stuff like that. And so... So those it's, are the stuff you put on the chart, the, the, the time management course, the non-negotiables and... Yeah, the non-negotiables. So also lunchtime <laughs> mm. or like sports. Um, and to start with, these are the times that are not available. So what, how much can I do this week with the time that I will be awake and willing to put this into my work and so there's no one formula right so there's no way to say you have to work only eight hours and then you have to relax for eight hours and do all other stuff that us humans need to do to stay alive and then you sleep for eight hours it would it sounds logical but it's not how it works so everyone has to find their own formula on how much sleep do I need what do I need to be fit and to be ready to also when is my brain at my best like um Everyone has like four hours in a day that you can easily focus and concentrate. We also have downtime. And so if you would like plan reading, I would prefer doing that in a context that suits me. And at the moment that my brain is ready to do so. Um, and to plan the type of activities according to how your biorhythm is functioning. And um, you don't always have the, the choice in it because at the, um, the nano electronics organization where I worked, some of the, um, the equipment would only be free between 2 and 5 a.m. Yeah. for students. Yeah. So I, I met some who literally slept almost under their desks while their experiment was running. But you only do that in exceptional cases. You don't do that all the time right so these are like the heroic stories that you can tell later on after your phd defense like i slept under my desk yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you also have to question what habits am i creating and is this still what i need yeah yeah and uh, i uh, we are going to deviate a bit from what we talked about okay. before we started like the, the whole the stuff that we were talking in general <laughs> but a question that came to me that, that i'm very curious about um so you have a lot of clients i'm guessing who come to you when they are transitioning out of academia academic world and they come to you with all this like shifting this transition related questions are where can I work what can I do okay go through the first um, steps of finding the yeah. strengths finding the, the job that you like do you can, can you say a bit what happens afterwards have you ever had these like the number of people who you were able to talk to after they transitioned and they came back to you somehow like did it work did it not work like what happens after we transition well actually you keep transitioning <laughs> <laughs> because it's never about the destination it's about the road oh yeah um and well actually what we learn people in career coaching is on how do i make decisions that suit me that fit with who i am and you will have more decision moments in a career. Um, apparently, it's every seven years. For me, it was every two and a half years. Uh, thinking about, am I still happy here? Is this what I want to do? Where do I want to go? Also, every new step that you take creates their own struggles. I also coach people who are, have a tenure track. And so they got to Valhalla. <laughs> Because of, they love, because, because of their, their, their passion and their love for the research that they do, and they love doing what they do, it's just that it's a bit much. And so when it's a bit much, it becomes, you know, passion gets eaten by a bit much. Mm. And too much passion can kill you too. Um, so I also see people who then get to that next level who are basically happy to be there yet they are still experiencing stress 
um, because of the it's it's a, it demands new things and also new habits again. So it's once again learning what am I what are my strengths? How can I apply them here? So I also people, see people who come back um, and also see people who thrive in their next steps and who are really, really happy with, with where they're going. And I'm always happy to see when they take a next step that they didn't need me for that. Mm -hmm. Because that means that they've learned. They've learned how to make the decision that is necessary and they move on. Mm -hmm. So that's the most rewarding for me as, as a career coach is when I see people taking more steps without me having to have been there. Yeah. Oh, that, that must be a moment of pride for you. Oh, I, I... always. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm mainly proud, pro I'm mainly proud of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. And um, I have another question that came to me spontaneously a bit when yeah, you were yeah. talking about your own uh, story, your journey and uh, why you had burnout yeah. in the past. And uh, with the one about the full-fledged one, you mentioned that you had a conflict with yeah. one of your uh, like supervisors or managers yep, or something, bosses. And that's also something that happens a lot in academia. True. Unfortunately, yeah, many of my clients come to me with those questions like, okay, I, I am stuck here. Like I'm stuck yeah. here, here, here. And there's like nobody helping me. Of course, I end up in burnout because my yeah. boss is like this. So do you also have clients that come to you who come to you with these questions? Like, what? how do I solve this yeah and, and what do you tell it. them uh, yeah. yeah well actually it's one of the reasons why some people and and there, there's this saying in the company world that says people join a company and leave a boss <laughs> and that is easier outside academia because if you're like um one and a half years in your phd um there's not really a way of of moving that same research to another research group in another context and still being able to continue and to graduate. So that is a very tough one. Um, I have seen people who crash on internet, in interpersonal uh, things. Um, it, it, fortunately, it's an exception to have a promoter from hell, but some people have a promoter from hell. Um, there is as many lunatics in the academic world as there are in the rest of the world. So you also unfortunately have a, a slight portion in the academic world who are straight down lunatics. And so if you work for someone with uh, these bizarre tendencies, then it really gets a very firm struggle. Like if I continue, can I endure? And is that even possible? Can I can I talk about it to this person and make it better? Can I solve it? Not always possible. Can I endure? Or is this the moment in which I have to decide that this is not my place and take the risk of not graduating by moving to another research group? Yeah, yeah. That's a tough one because there's, you know, in outside academia, There's also a lot at stake, right? So um, I see people who have been with the same organization for 25 years, they've built up a number of benefits. And so they don't want to leave themselves when they get into a conflict with their, their manager. And it can happen to you at any moment in your career, right? Awesome. Some people have it early and some people have it really late. My latest one was 62 years old. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time she experienced it. That she had a conflict that she said, this <laughs> is really not working for me. Um, so she was quite, quite lucky, actually, to only experience it at 62, although she didn't learn to deal with it then. Yes. So, but there, I would say the struggle is, there is a real struggle, but the stakes are still less high than if your entire future by obtaining this PhD degree depends on it. Yeah. And I've seen dramatic cases, fortunately just a few, 
but I've seen people who got really exhausted because their promoters were like playing games like, yes, but if you have this one publication or make sure that you only have this one publication. And so either you keep going and going and going, correcting, 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 like you did nine times, hoping that at some point you will get this one publication. And then um, in some cases, that's the only one that was there. And so even after obtaining with a lot of grief and energy loss and a lot of sleepless nights and a, all practically devastated self-esteem that this person could not go to a research position in the uh, industrial world because of this lack of elaborate publication list. Mm -hmm. So these are, fortunately, they're very rare, but to me, these things are dramatic. And what I learned is that um, as a coach, I think we have to be really honest and say, okay, so this is what's going to happen. <laughs> And so you have to choose what it's worth for you. Yeah. And and to to before we wrap up, I also want to ask this. So we talked a lot about PhD students and like early career yeah. academics. Do you also get clients who are like professors worked in academia, made it, quote unquote, you know, after the PhD, you were yeah. able to start like a professorship and everything yep. and still come to you with the same issues that PhD students have, for instance. Like, the, can you say a little about that? Yeah. Well, um, once they reach that level, I don't see them very often because they have a lot of freedom to fill in their work life as they as they please right so um let's say that that's past the struggle uh the struggle um levels um what i do see sometimes is that they you get promoted on working with the content right so mm -hmm. that you uh, and it's also what, what you love it's what drives you and that the higher you climb the ranks also in academia, the more you get into managerial things. Mm. So you get more meetings and more budgets and more contracts and more whatever. All of these things that can add a new dimension and can be very pleasant, but also can take over the content. And then you get PhD students who complain that their promoter maybe has not been in the lab for the past 20 years. And then I think, well, I can imagine how, that's, how that works. But also at that level, uh, people have to reevaluate every now and then. Am I still in my sweet spot? Um, and what is giving me energy, taking my energy? And can I somehow um, craft my work my job my position mm. by delegating more by saying yes to this and no to that or to other internal roles within the organization because professors have these two um, and another struggle that i see uh, more with them is um, time management wise getting around to the things that they love doing and getting around to um i have one person, for instance, who really likes teaching and getting enough time to prepare for teaching um, and also to get enough time to do research, because obviously you want to have both. Um, and so to, to organize themselves with these new responsibilities and more responsibilities, and there actually I see the same struggles as I see with people who climb the ranks in other organizations mm -hmm. on refining a balance and recrafting your job in a way that you still love doing what you're doing. I never came across people with a professorship who left academia. I, I don't think that even happens a lot apart from when you retire. Mm. But then still you are emeritus, so you're still in the academic world. Yeah. The, the thing is between between this this PhD time and the getting to the professorship rank, there is like a huge gap. The gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It was struggle level. Ex exactly. The, yeah. That one year, two year contracts over and over and over again. Yes. And for decades sometimes. That's... Yeah, indeed. And um, 
it's also a matter of still being clear about what you want. Uh, because that's also something that I saw. I had a lady in a, in a course that I gave at the university and um, she was a postdoc for 12 or 15 years already. And after the course, she said, well, actually, I never told anyone that I want to move on. <laughs> and so learning how to play the game that at least you get asked for a number of positions to, to be a candidate for a number of positions. That's also something that we have to learn them sometimes. Like, okay, so you have to apply for these things. Mm. Mm. Um, and to want it enough. Because you have to want it enough, right? You have to get through this level of one year, two year, one year, two year. Um, and that means that you have somehow, you have to have a vision of, why am I doing this and having enough fun along the road? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do know people who want it enough, but still don't get it. But that's the conversation for the next podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Well, the spots are limited, obviously. So um, yeah. it, true. It is possible that you do all the things right. And still you don't end up in the seat. And that's the moment when you need to think about, okay, if it's not this, then what else will it be? And how can I build still on all the skills that I have acquired and do something that I find equally useful as the research that I was doing? Yeah. Yeah. There's also a thing about purpose. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe we can do a podcast about purpose too. There's so much to talk about, but I, I know that. Yeah. You and before we close, I would like to, yes. uh, like we have a few minutes. I yeah, want to yeah, ask you, like, how can people find you if they want to work with you or if they want to, like, uh, find your work? And secondly, if you want to talk about that in a, a few sentences, you are preparing a new program for uh, yeah. like early stage academics, PhD students, yeah. and maybe early postdocs about career self-help. So if you yeah. could say a few things about that. Absolutely. So finding me is easy. It's just go to makemefly.be and there you will find it. Um, we don't have that much information in English on the site, but you will find the profiles of the people who work in English. You will find them there. So there you can find me as well. And um, one of the projects I'm going to um, currently, while we're recording this, uh, I will start the recordings for um, a video program with a, with a handbook, you know, taking people through the steps of who am I, where do I want to go, uh, what are my big dreams, what are my beliefs that, that help, what are my beliefs that, that keep me back from doing this, and what do I need, so all of these things, also how does the labor market work, um, how can I translate my experience into, into my CV, how do I recruiter sweet CVs. I was a recruiter for about 25 years or so. So, um, and I, I know how a recruiter reads the CV. So it's good to know that when you make up your own. Um, so that will be in the, in the program. And we have a general one in Dutch, um, but I'm going to make one specifically for academics because I noticed in one of the recent workshops that they um, it was it was actually it was the most fun workshop I gave and I do a lot of fun workshops it was the one that I adored the most last year where 39 uh, PhD students who attended an online training of a full day and they were so enthusiastic and they kept asking me questions like on how, how do I say how much I want to earn and can I can I negotiate on that and can you have a look at my CV and it was it was um, it was really rewarding oh, so much so fun to do so that's what i'm going to put into several episodes for mm -hmm. all of these because there are more than 39 i guess it, well yeah. obviously <laughs> i am yeah. one of them yeah. <laughs> I, the, these questions are still, still there the for same. many people right yeah absolutely so, and this program will be in english 
Yeah, the, the program will be in English. Uh -huh. Yes, amazing. Absolutely. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I noticed that indeed in the, in the academic world, there's so many people who come from so many places and um, not all of them master Dutch and that's okay. Yeah. Um, however, as a career tip, if you want to work in Belgium, in Flanders, especially learning the local language will definitely help you to get a job. Yeah. Even when you work in an international business, then still learning the language will be a great asset. Yeah, yeah I think correct. you're already pretty advanced in Dutch, no? <laughs> Try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you are. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much for taking the time, for being here, uh, sharing your else wisdom with us. And hopefully we can have another episode in the future to talk yeah. about the, all of the stuff that we couldn't get to. Yes, we will definitely have more of these. <laughs> okay, thank you thanks so, so much. much for having me here. Okay. Have a great day. <laughs> you too. Bye. Bye.